Gaia Tree mm. Nursery has operated since 1989 as an organic wholesale nursery, now with a successful mail order nursery online at www.dialatree.co.nz. Ben is author of Growing Organic Trees, Growing Trees for Wood and Fruit Without Chemicals, which can be bought either from Ben or from Amazon. And you can re also read Ben's tree stuff blog on his website. Hi, Ben, and welcome to the webinar. Thanks, Kate. Hello there. Okay, welcome everybody to this webinar, which trees should I choose for my orchard? We'll be looking at which are the most dependable and obvious fruit trees for each climate area that you may inhabit, with some ideas about who to approach for help and which species do well everywhere in New Zealand. First off, who am I? My name's Ben Geyer. I've worked in horticulture as manager of my own plant nursery for 30 years now, growing timber trees, fruit and shelter trees for farms and forestry. Working with farmers, I've learned from them what their tree requirements are. I've always been organic. I grow all sorts of fruit trees in very challenging conditions in the South Island, both on the West Coast and in the Nelson Mountains. I manage my own two blocks of very varied tree crops. Species include apples, hazelnuts, hardwood timbers, cypress timber, citrus, pip fruit and subtropicals. For six years, I was the regular author of my column in the orchard in the New Zealand Lifestyle Block magazine. And I'm the author of Growing Organic Trees, a lifestylist tree guide. My mail order nursery is called Dial a Tree. Now, this first map shows the two main divisions for choosing trees in New Zealand. When we choose to improve our lifestyle or farm orchards, which trees should we choose to plant? This important boundary between hot and cold areas is essential to consider when making tree choices. Most of the warm parts of New Zealand are north of this line and cold areas to the south. Below this line, frost rules out most subtropical trees. We have so much variation in microclimate from one farm to another. Anything could work, but only within sensible limits of the plant type and the climate. So don't bother trying to grow mangoes in Southland or strawberries in the tropics. North of this line, your stone fruit may not get enough frost for good apricots. South of here, most subtropicals like oranges will be killed immediately by the very first frost of the winter. However, pip fruits, peaches and blueberries love a good frost and in the right kind of year are covered in fruit. So frost can be a benefit or a limiting factor. For example, grapes. In Otago, you may find they do so well, you want to make a career out of them. In Northland, you might become enthusiastic at the huge diversity of semi-tropical crops from bamboo to bananas that can be produced from a small farm. Try everything, but use some common sense. Don't waste time trying to grow coffee in Queenstown or bananas in the Alps. Wet and dry. The next diagram shows an equally major divide for fruit trees. West of the central ranges, the rainfall is high. At my place in Hokitika, up to six meters a year. East of the mountains, it's generally dry, challenging for subtropicals and citrus, but ideal for olives, grapes, and stone fruit, given the right conditions. Now, the four winds. If we combine the two maps, we get four corners of the country, roughly showing the northwest is warm and wet, the northeast is warm and dry, if you ignore the cyclones, the southeast is cold and dry, and the southwest generally cold and wet. This is a good rough guide for choosing reliable varieties. For example, each climate area favoring a different type of typical tree. In the warm northwest, the climate favours tamarillos, a subtropical South American tree tomato, which grows well with high rainfall and regular feeding, under some shelter like a carport to keep any frost off. Moving to the northeast, we have warm and dry conditions, best of all for grapes and olives, but also with a bit of irrigation, citrus would be a typical crop to succeed up here. Think of Gisborne and the orange orchards, Hawke's Bay and Pinot Noir.
As we head southeast, the winters are cold, but the summers are long and dry. The typical tree for this area is the stone fruit, as shown by the Otago orchard areas. An ideal crop here would be any stone fruit, plums for the coldest areas, also peaches, and shown here, a plum cot, those little red ones, a type of delicious plum apricot cross. And pip fruit like apples love the southern areas of Otago and Southland. They actually need a certain amount of hours of frost to set good blossom. And down in the southwest where I live, it's generally considered cold and wet overall. Nevertheless, there are potential orchard trees that love these conditions. Pip fruit, in fact. Notably, Nashi pears, or any other good pear varieties, like Conference or Burr Bosk. Pears grow nearly anywhere in New Zealand. We are truly blessed. More about pears later. Other important sources of information to make your choice are local groups like the Tree Crops Association or the local library, and even your museum will have records of old time fruit trees grown in your area. Local knowledge is vital. So ask your older neighbors what grew around there when they were kids. Talk about the old days when people had orchards. Find out what your area, what fruits your area used to be famous for. As you dry your peach and apple slices on the old coal range at aunties, ask the wise and you will get expert advice. Tree nurserymen are also useful for this. At your local tree supplier or garden centre, talk to the person with the dirtiest hands. Ask the hard questions. Why did my lemon tree die? Why can't I grow mangoes or coffee? Which fruit trees do well in this area? Read my book, Growing Organic Trees, which distills 30 years of my tree mistakes into a few useful pages of information. I've tried every kind of fruit tree and found some good surprises. Limes and tamarillos grow well with lots of patience. Also, the coffee, macadamias and lychees die at the first hint of frost. Be bold too and experiment. Remember, our ancestors grew plants themselves by trial and error. So follow your dreams, save and sow your best pips, put plum stones into the freezer, beg cuttings from your green fingered friends vines, try grafting workshops at your local tree crops association. Some fruit bushes are easily propagated, like currants, for example, from cuttings. Others are diabolically difficult, like blueberries and olives. You'll soon find what grows easily for you. And if you grow too many, Donate them to your local school's market day for the neighbours to benefit. Now for a brief summary of the trusty dependable fruit trees. You can probably plant all of these in most areas of New Zealand and they will succeed, except right next to the sea or in the snowy mountains, which are both very harsh areas restricting your success. In the cold or southern half of Aotearoa, you should try pears. Pears suit New Zealand's overall climate, being more extreme than England's and conceivably more like France. Nashi and conference pears are both very happy anywhere. If your trees are overladen with pears or apples, cider is a good storage method for the ones you know you're never going to get round to bottling. Which brings us to apples. Good old apples have followed humans around for thousands of years. They even grow in the snowy mountains too. They should always be the first choice for any fruit tree in any situation in New Zealand. This country grows 5% of the world's export apple supply. That's amazing. What apples really love is all day sun and well-drained soil. They must be fed every year with manure or compost. Big old apple trees you thought were rubbish can respond brilliantly to this treatment. Apples keep the doctor away and modern science is finding this to be true. With tests for health promoting anthrocyanins, that's the red bits, finding the Monty Surprise apple to be twice as health giving 
as its nearest rival. This picture shows a Blenheim orange, a large heritage apple variety with great flavour. Other bulletproof organics survive in the wilderness varieties of apple include Fuji, a Japanese variety, Egremont russet, healthy with its own distinctive flavour, and Sturma pippin, a good all round cooker or eater. Crab apples, too, give wonderful displays of blossom and attract bees to pollinise your other apple trees. Plum trees survive over most of the country except by the ocean, with New Zealand's favourite varieties being black and red Doris, green gauge and ox heart. All these varieties of plums love to be pampered and produce superior fruit. Part of our tree crops heritage, plums are often overlooked. It will be important to find the right variety for your area's climate, cold and warm strains being quite different. One of my favourites is this pluot shown here, a delicious cross between a plum and an apricot, which is like a really juicy plum. Cranberries. These aren't really cranberries, they're a type of guava, but everyone knows them as cranberries. These are reliable all over New Zealand. Everyone's discovering the New Zealand cranberry with its ice cream flavour and healthy edible box hedge appearance. They thrive in the warmer areas without too much frost or drought. Birds seem to leave them alone, unlike blueberries, and children love to graze on them. Talking of grazing, blackberries and thornless blackberries, such as tay berries, produce fabulous crops of yummy berries for pies and freezing, even in the coldest mountain areas. They like to be trained and pruned like these ones here in the Nelson Mountains. They do take a bit of work, pruning and tying, but having no thorns is a bonus compared with the wild blackberries and they're just as delicious. Easy to freeze for using all year round. Hazelnuts. Nuts are often forgotten in orchard planning but hazelnuts are the easiest grown cold climate vegetable protein tree. They have a long lead time, 10 years or more to really start producing. But for a year round supply of nuts and homemade Nutella or salted hazelnut butter, they're worth the wait. They do best in a hedge of a dozen or more as they wind pollinate each other. Like apples, they survive big frosts and will grow far inland beneath the rocky crags, but they dislike strong winds and drought. Better in a dry area and a warm area, mainly in the North Island, there are other staple fruits that should automatically be tried as part of your food forest experiment. Olives, are mainly restricted by frost, but surprisingly, liking the dry, will grow in the wet areas of the map, provided they have good drainage. You can build a planter above the ground to grow good olives in a wet area. The Italian varieties seem to do best, as Tuscany in Italy has a North Island climate range. The varieties called Frantoio and Lecino are good and also the Spanish olive manzanillo. Fijoas, another guava, have had a huge surge in popularity and double as a windbreak hedge. They handle fairly coastal winds there on the Carpeti coast, although not so much down this way in the South Island. And the new varieties such as Apollo and Unique are sensational with massive fruit like all subtropical fruits and all guavas, they like shelter, warmth, plentiful water, but good drainage, and above all, plant food. They love a thick mulch around the root zone of compost, manure, seaweed, dead fish heads, anything that comes to mind in the organic material department. Feed your fruit trees well and often, and they will feed you back. This is even more true 
of subtropical fruits like Thejoas. Loquats are another easy subtropical to grow. The loquat or pea par is a fast growing hardy subtropical fruiting tree from Southeast Asia. If you cannot grow other subtropicals, you should be okay with this one, as I've seen it growing well inland in heavy frosts, though not in the winter snow zone. They're native to the mountain areas of Asia. They're also grown in Israel and Brazil. As with many plants, the simple seedlings are hardier and healthier than more ambitious, flashy varieties. We could continue with other exotic fruits like kiwi fruit, citrus and grapes. They're all easy to grow in the warmer areas, given plenty of food and attention, wind shelter and good drainage. For more information, see my book or visit the website at dialatree.co.nz. So the dependable cold hardy apples, pears, nashi pears, berries and plums are all dead certain to provide fruit for you in the long term. Even peaches, apricots and cherries east of the main divides. Fijoas and citrus in warmer areas will gradually build your supply of fruit for eating and bottling until you have a surplus to preserve, give away or trade. In conclusion, look at your own climate restrictions, talk to the wise and experiment. Meantime, the essential lesson is give things a try while you decide. Plant the old dependables first and try your favourite new strains too. I'll now hand you back to Kate for any question and answer sessions. Hi, thanks very much, Ben. That was great. I think you, you didn't actually mention that the most limiting um, aspect of growing trees, which is owning goats, um, which I... <laughs> That's right is my problem okay thank you very much for that now we have uh, lots of time for questions so if i can remind people if you look at the attendee pane you can ask a question in there just type in your question and send it in you can send it in while ben's answering other questions we do have some already uh, but yep keep the questions coming if you've got a question about your area or about um, a particular variety that ben might know something about then Ask the question and we'll get we'll get Ben to answer it. Okay, so thank you very much for that. Um, first thing, I'd just like to say hello to Sherry uh, Johansson. Yes, acknowledging how wet it is in Foxton too. <laughs> yep, it's wet everywhere. Um, so our first question is from Bryce, and he's saying, Ben, what's the uh, how do you rate the soil type over warm, cold, dry, wet? It, I mean, is there a big difference? He says he's on uh, volcanic clay and want to grow berries and fruit. Okay, well, probably the best, simplest answer to that is uh, you could do a, another map with um, wet soil and dry soil. Um, it doesn't really matter what the pH or the chemical composition of your soil is. If it's waterlogged, it's not going to be very good uh, for fruit trees. If it's free draining, it's going to be much better. And the, I often get asked this being on the West Coast is how to get round wet soils. And the simple answer is don't dig a hole, plant on top of the ground and build up a, a layer of compost around your tree roots and stake the tree so that they're actually growing above the water table and not with their roots drowning in it. I, I hope that's a helpful, simple answer. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it is. I had something we um, up here in, the, we were on clay as well, um, up here in the north and very wet. Um, it's quite funny, I realised because you were talking about east being dry, and I think of myself as being on the east, but looking at your map, no, I'm definitely in the west. <laughs> I'm in the wet zone. Um, but yeah, we're on clay as well, and I tried planting avocado, and the, it, it did really well until it got down to the clay, and then it just died. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it just turned up its toes. It was doing really, you know, lovely and healthy through all the topsoil, and then just like, nah. Yes, something like an avocado is tricky because you've got the additional problem with subtropical fruits as they grow very quickly and you'll get a couple of good seasons and you'll get this wonderful huge tree and you'll be amazed and then you'll get a really stormy, horrible wet season and it'll be all top and no base, it'll rock, it'll open a hole, it'll drown its roots and it'll die. 
So you do get these flash in the pan things like avocados that are really impressive for a short while and perhaps not, not suited at all in the long term. Yeah, I mean, we live in a, in a um, big avocado growing place up here, but they've got different soil. They're obviously not on clay soil that um, gives us the problems up here. OK, thank you for that. I've got a question from Leslie Wheatley. Hi, Leslie. Are apricots suitable for just north of Auckland? Do they need a pollinator? Uh, now, I wouldn't be able to give you specific variety names for that area, but I'm pretty sure that there are New Zealand developed varieties of apricot. Possibly Travat is springing into my head, um, and Golden Drop. Um, th these are old, established New Zealand varieties, and they will be suitable for the Auckland area. Um, it's it's usually the, the old, old world varieties that are much used to a very, very cold chill and the commercial varieties in Otago, but you definitely, if you ask people who know better than me uh, about a variety name for that area, you'll find one that needs less winter chill. Uh, and I'm sure they'll live there. Peaches certainly grow well in the Auckland area. Yeah, I should also probably point out that I know Leslie and she has goats too, so huh, good luck, Leslie. Um, ah, <laughs> good fences will be essential then. <laughs> of course. Um, I've had, uh, okay, I've got another, qu oh, I've got quite a lot of questions coming in here. Um, so Cherise is um, coming back on something we were talking about avocado. She said, do they just not like water or is, what is it that causes them to die? Um, well, in, in your example, you were talking about a clay soil and yeah. um, uh, see, I, I've got avocados, believe it or not, growing here. They've never flowered. Um, but the trees will grow, and that's because I'm very lucky to be on sand. And okay, I get six meters of rain a year, and this is this is the same with citrus, incidentally. Um, and a lot of subtropicals is that they love the rain; they just don't like their roots being waterlogged. Um, so if you can somehow contrive to have a high rainfall but also a free draining soil, uh, and obviously no frost, you will get an avocado growing. Um, but what, they, what they're not liking and what citrus don't like either is to get their roots down into a wet, high water table. Are there, uh, any, uh, are there any fruit trees that don't mind that? Um, well, the pears do okay in clay soils, and there's definitely varieties of plum and apple um, from the old, old heritage varieties that will thrive. And, you know, they've been developed for Herefordshire clay and things like that. Okay. Um, but uh, it is definitely a, quite a challenging soil type for success in fruit trees. Great. Why did I buy this property? No, no, it's, it's <laughs> wonderful. Um, uh, Bryce has come back. Uh, ben, I remember a nutty little apple called uh, Egmont Russell. And this is uh, Bryce who's in Northland. Can he still grow it up here? Yes, I think I mentioned that in my you talk. You did mention it's, it. Um, I, I remember that. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually his proper name is Egremont Egg Russet. Right. Yeah. And and there's also um, a, a similar variety called Merton Russet. And they're absolutely delicious apples. They don't need to be small, but they have an incredible flavour. Um, sort of pineapple that's described as. It, it's almost like a separate fruit to apples. It's got an amazing flavour. And a lot of the like a lot of these old heritage apples, when they have rough, gnarly skins, they seem to be more disease res resistant, less prone to scab and so on, and possibly better for organic production. Well, that's um, that. But I know that um, I've got an uh, Egremont russet and it's a great producer here in very difficult conditions. Thank you for that. That actually takes us nicely on to Cherie's next question, which is what are your thoughts about organic sprays? What do you use to control pests in your orchard? Right, that's a good question. Um, often I get asked, for example, about the lichen and moss on orchard trees. Should I spray that off? And um, there was a very good article recently in the Tree Cropper magazine uh, where the guy looked into this historically and found that, in fact, the incidence of red mite increased since all the orchards commercially started getting rid of lichen, um, which suggests that it harbours a predator of red mite. Um, so the moss and lichen is probably a good thing to keep and not spray off. Um, you, using organic controls is the short answer to that, is building up good bird and insect populations so that your predator species are controlling the problem species before they become a problem.
but I basically don't really spray at all. What the, the one spray I will use is garlic. Um, and the other thing I use is a thing called conqueror oil on citrus trees because they're very prone to the little scale and that black mold. And if you're really serious about citrus, you've got to spray it. It's a harmless oil and it just stops the scale insects being able to cling on and they all slide off. Um, so I do use that, but I don't use any other sprays really in the orchard. I certainly avoid anything that might affect uh, pollinating insects. Um, that's my main aim is to build up living populations of insects and birds for pest control. Excellent. Um, I've got a lot more questions coming in right now. Um, it's quite funny. I know a few people on the uh, webinar tonight. Obviously, we all have the same interests. And Thane, who's a neighbour of mine, says having the same heavy uh, clay soils as Kate, I can see her goats. Um, I'd be interested in a little more detail about how to prepare the soil for fruit trees. So if you're going to, particularly if you're going to build above clay soils, what would you use in there? Okay, so my neighbour had um, an actually a commercial nasty orchard on the side of a clay hill in Barrytown, and um, he went through a, a divorce, so he decided he had to move his whole orchard. And he did what he realised he should have done the first time, was he got a front-end loader, he dug up the pear trees, the nasty trees, he moved them around to his other property, and he put them on top of the ground, and then he got um, ute loads of seaweed and manure and stable manure and all this sort of thing and mounded them up around the roots and then staked the trees. So they were literally planted on top of the ground and not in a hole. And I think that is the key with clay. You'll have noticed in the summer it's a brick. It's completely dry and hard. And in winter it's, it's a swamp. It's totally waterlogged and there's nothing between. So the answer is not to dig a hole in it and collect the water. <laughs> But to actually plant above ground, if you. Yeah, I, I just want to point out that even my raised veggie beds at the moment are, are so unbelievably soggy. Um, but yeah, so that, <laughs> that, that's great. Thank you very much for that. Um, I have Rob yeah. asking a question. Have you tried vanilla and coffee? She sounds delicious. Um, this property is about 15 minutes north of Kate's Place. So, yep. Yeah heading up towards Bay of Islands. The paddock areas that I may plant have about six inches of soil, then clay. He was thinking of post hole boring and fertilizing to change the ground makeup. I think vanilla is too tropical. The only place I've ever seen it growing was in Noumea in New Caledonia. And that is, is basically a minimum of 20 degrees all year round. Um, Coffee? Coffee. I did try a coffee tree once. I put, bought this sorry specimen in a hardware store, took it home, put it in my tunnel house, and it immediately died in the first frost. And I think even north of Auckland, like the other year, you were mentioning that you had that near frost a couple of years back. It, it wasn't anything near a frost is going to immediately wipe out your coffee plants. Yeah, you know, he's even further north than we are. I mean, it, it, <laughs> we have beautiful weather up here. Just yeah. trust me. I wouldn't beautiful. have ruled it out. Because yeah, nobody knew that you'd be growing bananas up there ten years ago. True. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out. But I've never had any success with it down here. I'm guessing you're <laughs> not going to. We gonna... did get minus seven. So. <laughs> oh, good grief! I don't even like to think about that. Um, I'm, I'm guessing you're not going to um, think that using a post hole borer and then lots of fertilizer in that hole to change the ground makeup, because I, I think you can't actually change clay from cat you can make it you can use gypsum or, or sand to make it um drain better and you can you can use gypsum to try and break it up but from what i've been um reading about soil which is a lot because i've just uh, finished putting that soil and fert book together if you've got clay you're pretty much stuck with it um you can't yes and i think that's true you can condition the clay soil with gypsum and sand um, what they do um, in Karamea is they hump and hollow like they do with dairy paddocks. Um, you know, they get a digger in to break up that clay and make um, free draining sloped ground instead of flat. Okay. And then you, they plant tamarillo orchards on along the tops of the mounds. And that seems to work there. Um, I, that That's a possible thing you could do. Rather than digging holes, which are going to fill up with water and become like a bucket of water, and just drown your roots, you'd be better off like building mounds and planting on top of them, I reckon. Okay. That's just my take on it. 
I'm just a bit worried it might blow away up here. Um, okay, I have a question from James. James asks, are there any fruit trees that could be planted in a low point that's swampy with water running through it? <laughs> um, there's various food plants that could be planted in that situation. Wasabi would be one that springs to mind, or watercress. Now that sounds much more like me, I have to say, than fruit. <laughs> I don't have yeah, a, I don't and then have there's a fruit the trees. American cranberries, which um, you can they, they use water to float them to harvest them, but they're basically grown in a, a moist hollow. The true cranberry, not the one that I was talking about before, but the vaccinium, the American cranberry. Um, there, there's a growers cooperative group that, that you can join, and um, they basically set you up in the cranberry business. Okay. Um, blueberries are supposedly like swamp, but uh, I don't, I'm not sure if they're talking about a New Zealand swamp, though. That's pretty swampy. <laughs> um, I've got, yeah, definitely up here. I've got another question from Leslie saying, will conquer oil deal with mealybug? Um, yes, I think that is one of the sort of thing it deals with. Um, the best thing with citrus is to spray that oil and then do the hard yards with your thumbs and fingers and go around and just, you know, um, clean all the leaves with your hands as well, which is a huge task if you've got any kind of orchard. Um, but that's that's the most effective is to actually go around and, and wipe them off, all those bugs off physically as well, um, which is why people invented sprays. <laughs> when you've done that for a few years, you realize why all these things were invented and uh, you realize that we organic people are really pushing the proverbial uphill. <laughs> Um, okay, I've got a few more questions about um, control of pests and things. So Thane has asked, have you used neem oil for bug control? No, but I've heard very good things about it. And um, I think they've been using it for hundreds of years, haven't they, in India as an organic mm. bug control. Uh, it definitely gets a good write up in all the tree cropper reports. Okay. And I've got another one from Rob who says, have you ever tried chili water mix pest control? He came across that in Papua New Guinea. Yes, that's um, one you can now buy commercially in the garden centre, and I do use that for very young macrocarpa trees that get a little caterpillar, a moth caterpillar. And uh, that uh, sometimes I use the garlic, sometimes the chilli on that, and it's yeah, it's basically a very hot, peppery thing, and it puts off any moth or caterpillar very effectively. It doesn't seem to work with psyllids on pittosporums. They're quite difficult to get rid of organically. Okay. Thank you very much for that. I've got some advice um, for Thane from Leslie saying get coat compost to break down your clay soil. Do a deal with your neighbour. <laughs> yes, we that have plenty good. of compost if you want some. <laughs> uh, we're actually putting it on our paddocks, which is great. Um, okay, another question from Bryce. Can we try planting olives above our glazed clay soil in compost and how should we stake them? Yes, now I, I tried this situation with a neighbour who had an Italianate property and wanted an olive grove and they were actually on that clay in, in uh, six metres of rain. And so I suggested that they build a fake planter, basically a, a wooden planter, say a metre tall, a waist high, uh, uh, like a giant container uh, but with no base and just build that above the soil, fill that with your compost and plant food and plant the olive tree into that. Um, so that the, the trunk of the olive tree is emerging from the container a metre above the ground. Okay. And that should provide enough drainage to to survive. And when you say put compost in there, would you put topsoil and compost or just just compost? Well, yeah, something that isn't clay, yeah, something that's a better <laughs> medium. A, a good growing medium, yeah. yeah. Compost with plant food, yeah. Yeah, that sounds Soil good. conditioner. Seaweed. Or seaweed. Stuff. Yeah. I know um, we once visited somebody who uh, was uh, organically farming and we saw her compost heaps and one thing she did was there was actually a dead, I think it was a goat or a calf in her compost <laughs> heap, which was a little bit, um, a little bit scary, really. <laughs> yeah, a bit rural. A bit rural, yes. I don't mind the odd possum, but um, yeah. But certainly, as you say, any, anything that enriches the soil can can work. Um, OK, we're doing well with the questions here. Keep, keep sending questions in. We do have some more time. Um, but I have got yeah, on that, just on that line, uh, dead animals and birds are brilliant. They, they basically blood and bone on the hoof 
and um, if you've got you know your possums harvest from the previous night or a couple of dead um, lamb slicks or whatever you pop them under a grapevine and grapevines particularly like blood and bone and they, they'll really just munch up that uh, that former pet or whatever it is hmm. okay a warm yeah, it, it does sound a bit extreme but um, actually fruit trees do love dead animals under them they really do it's always good to have something new to threaten my chooks with when they're not laying, so that's good. <laughs> that's um, right, yeah. Make them lay. So uh, Leslie's asking, how many years does it take? A, sorry, how many years does a self-sown avocado take to fruit? I believe it's fourteen in ideal conditions. Um, however, they flower without fruiting. In my experience, certainly in the South Island. Um, what you really need to do is grow your seedling avocado to a, a respectable size if you've got the sort of climate like Golden Bay that you can do that in. And then you have to graft um, adult wood into the splice adult grafts into the branches um, of proper varieties. And then you get your, your flowers will actually pollinate. Uh, so it's actually quite a complicated and difficult process to get avocados grown from scratch in the home situation. Uh, and that's also why buying the grafted trees is very expensive because they're quite hard to get going. They take quite a number of years under control conditions. And then they die when they hit clay, trust me. Yeah, um, so, so but theoretically, you can theoretically in a warm climate get a self sown avocado to fruit after a number of years. Okay. Uh, but I have not had that happen in the South Island. Uh, Leslie's north, just north of Auckland, so that might be. Oh, well, that, yeah, that would be the ideal area to try it. Okay. You've got to be patient. I'm still waiting. 30 years. <laughs> You're very patient. Um, okay, Thane is asking maybe a little against organic principles, but have you got any thoughts on espaliering fruit trees? Espaliering is a very efficient way of maximizing the fruit production. Um, if you want to go down that track, then pears and apples um, really respond well to it. What the, it was a French discovery. What they found was that when you tie branches horizontally, you get more fruit spurs sticking up out of them. Uh, so what you have to do is go with your tree nurseryman and choose dwarfing varieties so they stay small and they're the best suited for espaliering and obviously find a suitable variety for your area and it's a very effective way of doing things. I've been to some interesting gardens in the UK where they've espaliered things in a tunnel so you've got an apple tunnel uh, round and at, at arm's length you can basically walk through the tunnel in summer and pick apples at arm's length all around you um, so yeah, it does seem to be a way of maximizing the crop That's I true. thanks for that I, I know from my own um, experiences of, of uh, gardens in Britain that a lot of fruit trees are going against brick walls there so there'll be south facing brick walls in the UK um, yeah, just keep off the north wind. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but also the, the, the bricks absorb the heat um, and then they can, in theory, grow warmer um, fruits that are, are suited to warmer climates. Um, yeah, that's the only way they can get apricots and peaches growing there, isn't it? And yeah. I think in Southland that would be the same sort of situation in Otago and Southland. If you wanted to try a peach, you could do it as a fan on a north wall and uh, completely out of that south wind yeah sounds good to me that's quite a good option yeah right. and, and like you say the wall provides a radiator and it and absorbs that heat would that work with uh, concrete water tanks putting something because that's what i'm thinking about planting bananas here and i'm thinking of using my concrete water tank um and planting not too close to it but close enough that it can it can absorb the heat and, and radiate yeah back yeah I, I would say that's probably a good idea and paint the whole thing black maybe I have to check what that would do to the water. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's interesting. It's it's very exciting that the different varieties that you can plant and what you can do to get around the limitations of our, of our areas. Okay, I've yeah. got more questions here. Um, Rob is asking, burying dead cows, animals, etc. Do you have to worry about disease, diphtheria, or anything else uh, when using the soil in the future? Hmm, I, I'm no expert on that. Um, I, I think if you don't, if you bury them nice and deep and don't really disturb them again, uh, you're talking about making giant compost heaps by the sound of it with a with a front end loader. And I think there's probably all sorts of rules around that. You'd have to look uh, into quite detail. Mm. If if you, for instance, had um, possums that had been killed through poison, 
would you still put them around fruit trees? I mean, would there be any? That would be totally up to your personal preference. Right. Um, but being organic, I wouldn't do that. But um, some people might not mind. It depends how persistent the poison is in the soil, um, things like that. Yeah, yeah. For example, I, I don't use um, wasps, um, what's that stuff, carbaryl in wasp nests because it's very persistent. You dig it up a year later and you've still got that poison smell in there. Okay. What, what do, um, so I think yeah, organic people would probably consider that a no-no to use poisoned animals. Okay. But I probably wouldn't poison the possums in the first place, but uh, we do up here. No, well, Tim's trap the Tim's trap's very effective. Yeah. They are. We do have Tim's traps too. We have lots. We have lots of ways of killing possums. Um, I've got another question from Bryce, which is Nathan's uh, popular firewood trees. Uh, what other yeah. suggestions? Is there anything else that's that's suited particularly to New Zealand conditions? I think we've got another whole webinar there in the offing <laughs> on firewood. If you have a look at my tree blog on dialatree.co.nz, there's a, a whole uh, blog on firewood trees. Um, the the quick answer is older is the, is the, the answer to all our firewood problems and night ends grow very quickly and blow down a lot and cause a lot of damage um, there are other eucalypts that coppice better ovata coppices better than night ends so you cut it down and it comes back better uh, and then macrocarpa is a tree that's old-fashioned and out of fashion but um, that's actually marvelous firewood very fast growing and there's nothing wrong with pines and willows if you want fast growing firewood that's you know not first rate but quick growing pines and willows instant biomass um i think very uh, productive. one thing that a question that arises from that is are there any good um food and firewood combination trees i mean are, are there um yes i know apple trees they used to use um in yeah. fireplaces because of the, of the scent it's a very beautifully scented yeah. when it burns yeah well apple pear and cherry would all fit that bill absolutely marvelously yeah cherry probably the best because it grows faster um they, they make lovely firewood very very hot slow burning you've got to season it for a long time possibly up to two years um, but nice big old apple trees split easy to the axe and you know, if you know an orchardist that's reworking his orchard, I mean, they put it all in the corner and set fire to it, don't they, somehow? <laughs> Crazy. So how do you, I mean, how much wood would you get from an orchard in a year in prunings? You wouldn't get a lot, I'm assuming. Oh, it's just how long's a piece of string. If you had a, a huge orchard and you were pruning it every year and you didn't mind burning small wood, you could probably fire up a bread kiln all year round out of it. It's oh. wonderful for baking with. Um, but, you know, I was thinking more of the big diameter when they're getting rid of the big old variety trees and replanting. Okay. If cool. you can get onto old apple trees like that, it is the premium firewood. Brilliant. Okay, we all need to try yes. that. Um, I've got another question from Cherie who's saying, we need acoustic protection from State Highway 1. What native trees <laughs> do you recommend for fast, native trees for fast growth but lush and bushy to protect us from some of the traffic noise? Ah, we, we were definitely wandering off fruit trees now. We are a bit. But I mean, um, people just want to ask you. I, I'm not sure about that. I, I've heard it said that trees don't actually screen sound, that it just bounces through them and um, you just hear the sound through them. Um, but I tend to think that anything with lush foliage would be the one rather than a, a woody tree. You go for a big foliage, uh, bushy type thing like a pittosporum. Um, the lemonwood pittosporum eugenioides is a pretty popular, easy grown screen tree. Okay. But, I, I, and then I guess flax would be another sort of muting sort of thing, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. With its big leaves. I think one thing uh, when we're planting here, um, so obviously we don't do so great with fruit trees, but we do plant a lot of fodder trees for crops. And if we're if we are yeah. planting a tree, we like it to have at least two uses. So you know, firewood or or whatever. But a lot of fodder trees. Yeah. So again, willow and um, tree lucerne, depending on where you are in the country, and poplar yeah. um, are yeah. all really great for that. And I'm not sure that obviously poplar would would die back in winter lose its leaves in winter but um i would definitely consider that because when you've got a drought on there is nothing as great as being able to to give your animals some um fresh green feed when they need it yeah so you've got a second use for it yeah and so often we seem to be having either as we are at the moment lots of rain or droughts um 
and yeah, I, so fodder trees would. I just thought I'd mention that. Um, right, great. some more questions. We've got a lot of people saying thank you um, for answering your question, so that's great. Uh, Leslie's come back and she's asked, if you've not pruned for some years, how do you go about catching up? Um, this is orchard trees. Yeah, fruit trees. Um, it is a bit of an expert job. If you can find the local guy who's the expert, get him to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's definitely a good thing to go on a seminar or a, a workshop on if you're your local polytech or um, uh, further education college might be running something like of that nature on uh, restoring an old orchard or you could ask them to and they'll dig someone out out um, it's definitely something you want someone to show you how to do um, you can restore old trees with a uh, You've got to think of them as roses. When you cut roses back hard, they flower better. And apples and all those things are a rose family. Most of the fruit trees are the rose family. And they're the same. The harder you cut them, the better they come back. Um, they can be overdone, but if you've got a great big gnarly old tree that's not producing, what have you got to lose? Hack into it, chuck a few new grafts on. You know, do your worst. Go for it. Got nothing to lose. Yeah. I but definitely, if you want to do it properly, get some instruction. I, d I did not realise there were roses. That's quite interesting. Okay, we've got yeah, uh, a, few roses, more, yeah. a few more questions. Uh, Kerry has come on. Hi, what's the way to grow pine tree seed? Does the seed need to pine be scarified? I find, yeah, I find it quite challenging to do organically. It absolutely loves chemicals, fertilisers and sprays, the old pine. Um, um, what I do is I open up the cones on the coal range so they pop out all the seeds, shake all the seeds out and then just um, put them in a fridge in a jar uh, for a week so that they think they've had a winter and then just sow the dry seed into a seed tray and don't keep it too wet because they're terribly prone to fungus, they damp off. So what I find is out of 100 pine tree seeds that sprout I end up with about 10 because um, they all get this fungus. And there's not much you can do about that, really, except um, control your moisture, your ambient moisture. And you don't scarify the seeds? Well, not unless you can't put them in the freezer for, for a week. That's probably enough. Okay, cool. You, you don't need to chip them. You don't need to physically chip them, no. Okay. I've got another question from um, a couple of questions from Rob, who, if, if you remember, is just north of um, where I am. So he's south Bay of Islands. Um, and he's got a problem, well, not a problem, <laughs> he's got a situation that we did have here, um, and he's talking about pines, and he's saying on the timber subject, he's got 13 hectares of pines, 28 years in two years' time. How long can he keep them before they're useless for sale, and what should he replant them in? Um, oh, uh, okay, before, that's good. While, while you're thinking about that sure. question, I'm just going to say that I, I loathe and detest pines, and one of the reasons is we've had to remove them from a few properties. We had about five yeah. hectares of pines here that we had taken out, and the mess they make, the, the guys of the property, is unbelievable. Um, but we yeah. found that it, that native, we, we've got quite a lot of native bush here anyway, we found that um, even just in, I think it's two years, the bird shit basically i mean that the seeds they've sown it's it's amazing it's coming back incredibly well a lot of gorse is in there but the gorse in this case will act mm. as a as a protectant for other species coming up so it depends on what you i mean i would plant again if i had to plant something i'd be planting fodder trees but that's yeah that's, i don't eat that much fruit because i don't have a sweet tooth so okay well, so presumably I, rob, rob may want to replant timber trees but um that what the up-and-coming timber tree is the cypress lusitanica the mexican macrocarpa and they grow as fast as pines but they're much higher quality wood and you end up with basically a macrocarpa type timber in, in the same time scale 28 years uh, so he might like to consider moving away from pines and planting cypresses um, the, the, the way to decide when to cut them is to find your destination mill. Find the miller and find out what size logs he's after and what his maximum size is. Because at 28, they're starting to get very big and they'll be too big for some sawmills to even cut. Um, so your limiting factor is how big they get and how big the sawmill guys can handle. It's also uh, up here certainly a very... Um, chancy business. Our neighbours 
started to get pines removed and they had a, a deal with a, a local company who were uh, logging and clearing and the company yeah. gave up after about three weeks and said the price is now making it uneconomic and they just walked off yeah um it's yeah it's often often timing can be important with price i think the price is quite good at the moment but um, it's always a, a must to get two quotes on these guys um you know there are pirates around and a lot of farmers complain that pines never make any money um the way to make money out of pines is to have a big area and to prune them to six meters right from the start and and then you can make money out of them but small uh small areas 13 hectares is quite big that's that's a good size mm -hmm. um, but you know little corners of paddocks and it's always going to cost you more to get them cut down than you're going to get back yeah and then also you do get these fly by night people who decide to give up halfway so it's definitely worth getting two or more quotes before you cut any trees down and and there's a certain amount of we've discovered infrastructure to pay for so we had to build a big yeah, get, get all that written down yeah. so that you, you know how much your costs are going to be before you before it happens just get um, rid of, i hate the pines i loathe yeah. and detest pines you might way. find that you might find there's quite a bit of variation in those quotes and, and also in the in the conditions you know what are they going to clean up how much are they going to clean up get all that written down Great advice there. And I think our final question, unless anyone's going to send in a last one, a final question from Kerry, who is saying, other than pine, what tree would you recommend for shelter belts in high wind areas? Right. Well, I wouldn't recommend pine in a high wind area at all, really, because they blow down. They, they're, they're like night ends. They grow too quickly and they haven't got a deep root. Um, the, the cypresses are, are quite good. Uh, um, natives are probably the best of all in, in your high wind area. If it's coastal, then go for coastal tolerant natives um, like Karo, um, cabbage trees, Totara. If it's a mountainous area, um, you might need to go for exotics and you might want to consider deciduous instead of just having a big wall of green. Um, if you plant something like older trees, they drop their leaves in winter and let light into the pasture. And also in the high winds of winter, they don't blow down because they're just twigs, but they still filter the wind and slow it. Uh, so that's something people often don't consider is planting deciduous trees instead of evergreens for shelter. Sounds great. Thank you very much for that, uh, Ben. I've got loads of people here. I'm just saying thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Ben, etc., etc. So, yes, thank you very much from all of us. Um, thank you. Uh,